Bonsoir à tous. <rire> Donc j'espère qu'il n'y aura plus de problèmes de, euh, de Larsen ou de ce bruit un peu, un peu strident dans la soirée. Je suis vraiment désolée. Donc, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Emily Rotaio. I'm curatorial coordinator here. Donc, je suis coordonnatrice curator curatoriale ici uh, au CCA. Et donc, uh, bah, au nom du CCA, je voulais vous remercier uh, d'être là ce soir donc, pour le lancement de cette 17e uh, charrette. Je sais que euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, il y a eu des, des activités euh, de l'ordre plutôt de la manifestation pour certains étudiants, le pluie, la pluie n'étant pas là. Donc en tout cas, bah, merci euh, d'être là et merci de vous être inscrits aussi si nombreux pour ce, euh, ce sujet qui, euh, qui, à mon avis, va donner des, des projets, en tout cas j'espère, assez, euh, assez intéressants. Donc euh, la charrette, c'est sa 17e année, c'est un, euh, un des événements pour les étudiants le, le plus ancien finalement du, du CCA. Et euh, c'est quelque chose que le CCA donc, organise avec, euh, cette année avec euh, euh, l'Université du Québec à Montréal, mais aussi en collaboration avec l'Université McGill, avec l'Université de Montréal, et puis aussi avec la participation d'autres universités. Donc... Euh, Carlton University, Ryerson University, uh, University of Toronto, qui est cette année un nouveau venu, qu'on est ravis <rire> donc euh, d'accueillir. Et euh, j'aimerais aussi citer des gens qui ont vraiment participé à cette charrette. Donc c'est bien sûr Marc Podebiuk qui a vraiment euh, mené, euh, mené cette charrette, mené cette, euh, euh, développé cette problématique sur l'eau, Water City, la ville liquide pour cette année, et puis euh, Aaron Sprecher de l'Université McGill, qui fait aussi partie des, des, des petites mains des organisateurs de, de cette charrette. Et puis euh, Valérie Mao aussi, euh, de l'Université de Montréal. Donc merci, euh, merci à tous. Et puis, tout à l'heure, je disais que la charrette est un des, euh, des, 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 plus anciens, euh, des plus anciens projets que le CCA mène aussi avec les étudiants, autour de la ville de, euh, de Montréal. Et c'est ça aussi depuis peu même d'autres projets qui peut-être aussi pourraient, pourront, pourront vous intéresser, tels que euh, des sessions libres pour, pour les étudiants, où finalement le CCA met à disposition des œuvres de sa collection pour des cours qui se font ici même euh, au CCA. Bien sûr, il y a toujours le, le cycle de, de conférences. Et puis un nouveau programme aussi qui est mis en place depuis cette année, qui est un problème, programme de stage et de résidence curatoriaux en fait, autour de l'idée d'exposition d'architecture. Mais pour revenir à la charrette, l'idée c'est vraiment la charrette d'offrir aussi l'occasion de réfléchir à, euh, à des thématiques euh, importantes, contemporaines pour la ville de Montréal mais aussi euh, en général, pour aider, pour participer au, euh, au débat, à la recherche, et au développement d'idées puis aussi à la créativité je pense. Donc, euh, à tous, euh, je vous souhaite bonne chance et je vais juste vous présenter comment va se dérouler la soirée. Euh, donc, vous savez tous que le sujet, c'est l'eau, Liquid City, à Montréal. Donc, Marc Podibuc euh, va euh, introduire le sujet en détail. J'espère que vous allez écouter attentivement. Le site aussi sur lequel vous allez travailler pendant ces, euh, pendant ces trois jours, donc jusqu'à dimanche. Ensuite, on a le, euh, le plaisir, l'immense plaisir euh, d'accueillir deux architectes, euh, Kim Soray et James Brown, qui sont des architectes de Toronto, qui vont euh, présenter de, de Brown and Soray Architects, qui vont nous présenter certains de leurs travaux qui sont vraiment en lien avec cette thématique de la charrette et de l'eau. Ensuite, euh, nous aurons le plaisir d'accueillir Layat Margolis qui va, elle, euh, vous présenter sa recherche sur euh, qu'elle a développée, en fait, euh, dans un livre autour de, euh, des environnements et en essayant aussi de vous présenter des projets qui sont reliés toujours à cette thématique. Donc j'espère que ça vous amènera aussi différents points de vue sur cette thématique permettant de développer aussi vous après vos propres, vos propres, euh, vos propres idées. Ensuite, Marc et moi, on revient. On pourra parler, vous pourrez poser vos questions sur tout ce qui vous inquiète aussi concernant les procédures de soumission. Comment, euh, voilà, on pourra en reparler ensuite. Et puis, euh, on a le plaisir aussi euh, d'accueillir Madame Phyllis Lambert, qui nous fait le plaisir d'être là ce soir, et qui donc dira le, le mot de la fin. 
Voilà. Bon, en tout cas, je vous souhaite bonne chance et puis euh, bonne écoute. Merci. Bonsoir. Problématique. Où est le Saint-Laurent, mon fleuve? Il est là. On ne l'entend pas. Il est comme le cheval qui attend dans l'écurie. On ne le voit pas. Mais je sens qu'il est là, qu'il coule en faisant semblant de ne pas couler, qu'il embrasse la ville. C'est une citation de euh, Régent de Charme, en effet, que j'avais trouvé dans un livre publié cette année, en effet, par, euh, euh, par Michel Dagenet, en effet, sur Montréal et l'eau, qui, parmi plusieurs autres, pour plusieurs autres raisons, en effet, m'a donné vraiment l'idée, en effet, de cette publication, euh, à proposer cette thématique de l'eau pour la charrette de, de cette année. Interdépendance. Montréal et son fleuve. Tio Tiake. Le nom autochtone pour le site de Montréal signifie « île au milieu des rapides ». Situé au confluent de fleuve Saint-Laurent et de la rivière des Outaouais, les îles de Montréal et de Laval créent trois chaînons de courants rapides descendant et se rejoignant à l'extrémité est de ces îles. Ville-Marie, la première colonie située à l'emplacement actuel de Montréal, fut établie à l'endroit le plus accessible pour les grands vénéveilleurs en amont de fleuve Saint-Laurent. Pendant trois siècles, l'économie de la ville fut largement dépendante de cet environnement hydrographique. En effet, la présence des rapides ne permettant pas le passage des grands navires de transport, des réseaux de, ba des réseaux de bateaux de petite taille et des voies ferrées se développent à partir de Montréal à travers tout le continent. Les formes de l'eau, glace et creux. L'île de Montréal, habitée par les premiers colons, était une riche plaine agricole entourée par le fleuve. Tra traversée par des ruisseaux, parsemée de, de, de marécages et dominée par le Mont-Royal. En hiver, la neige et la glace caractérisent le paysage de la ville, recouvrant l'île d'une couverture blanche pendant quatre mois. Le fleuve devient lui-même une surface de glace, créant ainsi un pont éphémère vers, vers la rive au sud de Saint-Laurent. Au printemps, d'énormes morceaux de glace forment des barrages et s'accumulent dans le, dans le fleuve coulant vers le nord, faisant temporairement augmenter le niveau de l'eau et inondant les zones les plus basses de la ville telles que Griffintown et Pointe-Saint-Charles. La disparition de l'eau en ville peu à peu, l'accès au fleuve fut transformé par l'infrastructure de port industriel et le fleuve fut perçu comme une sorte de chemin, chemin de fer liquide, dissocié de vocabulaire de l'urbanisme de début de la modernité. Le fleuve servait de goût à ciel ouvert, absorbant et diluant les déchets et les effluents de la métropole, alors en pleine croissance. Par ailleurs, les ruisseaux et les zones humides de l'île sont perçus de plus en plus comme des obstacles à l'urbanisation et comme risques pour la santé publique et sont drainés, canalisés dans les fossés alignés sur la grille des rues en développement et finalement enterrés dans un réseau de goûts souterrains. L'eau disparaît finalement de l'environnement urbain et de, le cons de la conscience des citoyens. Les cartes, on a fait comme, un peu difficile à lire, mais quand même donne indication. On a fait des documents, on a fait préparer par la Ville de Montréal, des services des tra travaux publics, démontrant, on a fait le bassin de la petite rivière à Saint-Pierre et graduellement, avec le temps, on a fait la canalisation et l'enterrement, on a fait des conduits souterrains euh, qui, on, quand même, on a fait, gardent toujours, on a fait une certaine relation avec la trame euh, euh, de la Ville de Montréal. Avec l'ouverture de la nouvelle voie maritime, re reconnecter la ville et son fleuve. Avec l'ouverture de la nouvelle voie maritime en 1959, permettant l'accès au Grand Lac pour le transport maritime et contournant l'obstacle de l'île de Montréal, la raison d'être géographique et commerciale de Montréal s'affaiblit fortement. Or, à partir de la seconde, seconde moitié du XXe siècle, la connexion entre le fleuve et la ville, entre les Montréalais et de l'eau, 
émerge comme un thème récurrent dans la planification régionale et municipale pour devenir un enjeu public pour le développement de la ville post-industrielle. Ce changement d'attitude est illustré de façon élégante, éloquente et avec l'exposition universelle Expo 67, implantée sur une série d'îles structurées par un réseau de canaux artificiels. De même, les intentions ambitieuses et encore inexploitées de le projet Archipel à la fin, fin des années 1970 sont un tournant dans la perception de bassin versant de la région de Montréal. Attendue depuis longtemps, la construction d'une installation de traitement des eaux usées au début des années 1980 contribue à l'amélioration significative de la qualité de l'eau de fleuve. Poursuivant dans cette optique le réaménagement des berges de Canal de la Chine en parc promenade urbain en 1978, ainsi que la réouverture de Canal à la navigation en 2002, le réaménagement très populaire de Vieux-Port en espace public dans les, dans les années 1980 et 90, et le débat en cours actuellement sur l'accès au secteur riverain et le réaménagement de la rue Notre-Dame-Est sont également des exemples parmi les autres facteurs de renouvellement de la perception de fleuve par les Montréalais. L'accès au fleuve a également été considérablement amélioré avec le développement des rives de fleuve tout au long des secteurs de Verdun à la Chine, ainsi que d'un réseau de parcs nateurs donnant accès aux bords de fleuve autour, tout autour de l'île. Les rares zones humides et les réseaux restants sont désormais soumis à une législation très stricte. Les enjeux actuels. L'état des infrastructures d'apprévoisionnement et de traitement des eaux est également un sujet préoccupant. Le système de goût composé d'un système combiné de goût sanitaire et de récupération des eaux de pluie, typique des villes nord-américaines plus âgées et vieillissantes, est incapable d'accueillir l'augmentation des précipitations résultant de changements climatiques. Partout dans le monde, les villes côtières sont confrontées aux conséquences de la hausse du niveau de la mer, et en particulier lors du réaménagement des anciens ports industriels. Les défis techniques, logistiques et économiques pour la création d'une infrastructure capable de supporter ces changements dramatiques ont donné naissance à de nouvelles façons de penser les infrastructures, sous forme de paysages, d'aménagement public et en forme de réseau. Il semble malgré tout que l'eau soit encore un élément étranger à l'environnement urbain car elle est encore considérée comme une ressource exceptionnellement abondante, prise pour acquise, ou une nuisance qui doit être éliminée aussi rapidement que possible. Entourée d'eau sur, sur toutes les côtés, entourée par la neige près de la moitié de l'année et accablée par des infrastructures vieillissantes et complexes à gérer, nous choisissons généralement d'ignorer le potentiel de l'eau pour l'enrichissement de l'expérience de la ville et de l'environnement. Le site, les quartiers Sainte-Anne et Saint-Gabriel, Griffintown et Pointe-Saint-Charles. La charrette porte cette année son, son attention aux quartiers Sainte-Anne et Saint-Gabriel comme site d'expérimentation et point de départ. Ces deux quartiers sont délimités sont délimités par la sortie du canal de l'aqueduc, aujourd'hui devenu l'autoroute 20 à l'ouest, la rue par le canal et la rue Notre-Dame au nord, la rue et finalement la rue McGill est à l'est et évidemment le fleuve Saint-Laurent au sud. Le site de cette charrette comprend donc, donc Griffintown et Pointe-Saint-Charles, le canal de la Chine et au moins un parti de la jetée Mackay, euh, euh, ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui le cité de Havre. Ces quartiers sont situés presque entièrement sous la ligne de contour topographique des 17 mètres. Ça, c'est un plan en effet qu'on a préparé qui démontre en effet le niveau en effet d'élévation par rapport au mer euh, à 15 mètres, 50 pieds qui était quand même, en effet, euh, souvent, en effet, plus bas que le niveau de fleuve en mois d'avril, à la fin du 19e siècle, alors des secteurs qui étaient chaque année euh, inondés. 
Certaines années, on a fait le niveau à atteint, on a fait jusqu'à 53 pieds ou 16 mètres. Et particulièrement en 1886, puis j'ai euh, quelques autres photos à vous montrer, um, le, le, le pire inondation euh, qu'on a vu, on a fait dans le, euh, la ville moderne à Montréal, a complètement recouvert toute la quartier. On a fait de Griffintown, Pointe-Saint-Charles, jusqu'au pied de Beaver Hall Hill. La relation entre le développement urbain et l'eau a défini le paysage de ces quartiers depuis plus de 300 ans. En premier, la marée naturelle, riche en espèces d'oiseaux et vie animale, a servi de terrain de chasse aux Autochtones jusqu'au jusqu au, jusqu au milieu du 19e siècle. Les méandres de la rivière Saint-Pierre s'enroulant dans la pente ouest de Montréal, se prolongeant en dessous de la falaise Saint-Jacques. Ça, c'est la rivière Saint-Pierre sur le, le dernier parti, en effet, qui est toujours au, euh, euh, visible aujourd'hui sur le terrain de golf euh, de Meadowbrook. Euh, qui se prolonge en dessous de la falaise Saint-Jacques et l'un de ses bras se jette dans le fleuve Saint-Laurent au pied de Pont Champlain actuel, la limite ouest du site pour la charrette, et un autre à pointe à calière L'ouverture du canal en 1825 ouvrant un voie de contournement autour des rapides et fournissant l'énergie hydraulique qui a participé au développement de corps industriel du Canada et des quartiers environnants au 19e siècle. Aussi, la construction de Pont Victoria, qu'on peut voir, en 1859, le développement par la suite des ateliers de la Grande Trunk et, par la suite aussi, ou en parallèle, de Goose Village ou Victoria Town, à partir des années 1860, un village riverain de 300 maisons construit au nord de Pont Victoria, puis démoli pour faire place à l'entrée de l'Expo 67 un siècle plus tard. Les inondations des années 1880 et en particulier la crue de 1886 qui a atteint la hauteur de 17 mètres et s'étendant jusqu'à la square Chaboyer et au pied de Beaver Hall Hill. Décrit de manière... Oh, des deux images, en fait, qu'on peut voir ici. Le square Chaboyer qui se trouve littéralement le coin de Peel et Saint-Jacques où se trouve l'école de technologie supérieure. L'ancien euh, gare Bonaventure, en fait, qui est un terrain vacant en ce moment, mais un peu plus haut, en effet, sur Saint-Jacques et la rue Peel. Euh, on peut voir en 1800, 1886, complètement inondé. Le square Chaboyer aussi en soi-même, en fait, comme on peut voir dans ces images, en fait, les deux, un provenant, en effet, de 1886 et un autre, en effet, de 1888. Le texte, euh, euh, ces inondations ont été décrites de manière très évocatrice par Jane Urquhart dans son roman « Away ». Particulièrement, on avait un paragraphe que j'ai bien aimé. « The whole population of the city had moved, depending on its location and elevation, one or two or several feet skywards. Business was being conducted from second-story windows. Wooden sidewalks, chained to front doorstops, were being used as landing docks, or in some cases as parlors where people in rocking chairs sat smoking and chatting in the sun. Small boats were rowed in and out of large ground floor windows. C'est presque une uh, un description un peu plutôt de Venise en Afrique de Montréal. Pendant le 20e, pendant le 20e siècle, oh, excuse-moi, le dernier point, en fait, c'est la construction ultérieure de la digue de Saint-Gabriel. Après, après les inondations, finalement, on a fait le gouvernement fédéral a réalisé qu'il a fallu faire quelque chose. Les digues Saint-Gabriel, tout le long, tout le porteur, en effet, de Pointe-Saint-Charles, était construit, en effet, pour protéger le Pointe-Saint-Charles, on a fait des inondations, et par la suite, on a fait de, des grandes constructions, des grandes réalisations de ce qu'on appelle, ce, ce qu'on connaît aujourd'hui comme le Vieux-Port, on a fait de Montréal, qui était réalisé au début du XXe siècle aussi en même temps, qui ont servi, parmi d'autres choses, à protéger la ville des inondations. Pendant le XXe siècle, le dépôt des déchets et des remblés dans le fleuve au pied de la Pointe-Saint-Charles jusqu'au moment de l'ouverture de l'Expo 67 a créé une barrière de presque un kilomètre de large d'enfouissement de substances toxiques entre le quartier résidentiel et le fleuve, coupant ainsi la population de tout contact avec le fleuve. Étonnant à voir, ça c'est Île des Sœurs, en effet, qu'on peut voir en arrière-plan. Euh, ça c'est une photo, en effet, immédiatement après la construction, en effet, de de euh, l'atelier de CN, on a fait à Pointe-Saint-Charles en 1929. L'expansion de la gare de triage de CN pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale, la construction des jetés Bickerdike et Windmill Point, ainsi que l'ouverture de l'autoroute Bonaventure, on peut voir, on a fait l'enfouissement, on a fait graduellement 1958, à gauche 1964, 
um, à droite, on a fait, puis on peut voir les remblés, on a fait graduellement, on a fait qui se... Et c'est littéralement les déchets, c'était le dépotoir, on a fait principal, un des dépotoirs principaux de la ville, euh, euh, des remblés, mais aussi des déchets. On peut voir la construction, on a fait de Pont Champlain en 1964 aussi en même temps. Alors, on peut voir, on a fait de cette carte faite par la Société des soirs de Pointe-Saint-Charles, euh, l'avancement, on a fait graduellement des rives, on a fait cette bande de presque un kilomètre de large euh, des remblés, on a fait qui étaient mis euh, dans le fleuve. L'ouverture de l'autoroute Bonneventure au bord du fleuve a enfermé cette séparation en faveur des, instructions, des infrastructures lourdes de transport et portuaires. Contrairement à l'accroissement de l'accessibilité et de la présence de l'eau dans d'autres quartiers de Montréal depuis quelques décennies, l'appropriation de l'eau dans Griffintown et Pointe-Saint-Charles est restée timide, presque exclusivement limitée à la transformation du canal de la Chine. En définitive, le canal contribue peu à l'amélioration la, de la qualité de vie des quartiers adjacents. Son influence ne se prolonge pas plus que de quelques mètres au-delà du corridor de la promenade. À une échelle complètement différente, la pratique de surf... Je, sais pas si je, je remercie Tienne, on a fait pour la photo. C'est... Um, <coughs> À une échelle complètement différente, la pratique de surf, apparemment, en effet, c'est une des dix places les plus populaires en Canada pour faire le surfing euh, 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 en bas, en effet, immédiatement en bas, en effet, au pied, en effet, de Habitat 67. Et un, ce sont des appropriations de fleuves audacieuses et exotiques, bien que marginales. Les nouveaux projets de réaménagement dans Griffintown et Pointe-Saint-Charles s'abonnent. Au moins 5 000 nouvelles unités de logement démontrent l'attrait que suscite la vie à proximité de canal et de l'eau. Et c'est important à remarquer parce que Pointe-Saint-Charles, depuis un siècle, c'est 5 000 portes. Et on en parle aujourd'hui, et ça c'est vraiment des estimations plus conservateurs de la construction, on a fait dans les prochains 5 à 10 ans, d'un autre 5 000 logements, on a fait dans le secteur. La première phase de réaménagement, par exemple, on a fait la première phase de la réaménagement de l'autoroute Bonaventure, dont 500 unités de logement. Un projet à Griffintown plus modeste pour un minimum de 1375 appartements dans quatre bâtiments près du canal entre Wellington et le viaduc. Le projet bassin de nouveau havre sur le site d'ancien tripostal, 2000 logements. Le réaménagement des terrains de CN avec 800 logements. Et finalement, les rénovations de l'édifice nord de Lac avec 1200 euh, logements potentiellement. L'eau joue un rôle structurant parmi certains de ces, de ces projets tels que les bassins de nouveau havre qui proposent une relation intime entre l'eau, le logement urbain et le canal de Chêne, grâce à la réouverture des bassins d'origine pour gérer les eaux de ruissellement redirigées vers le canal. Personnellement, j'avais travaillé, c'est moi qui ai fait cette esquisse, en fait, c'est personnellement travaillé sur ce projet. Et je peux vous dire, on a fait une des, des choses les plus difficiles à faire dans la vie, c'est apprendre une goutte de pluie on a, et, et pour leur permettre, en fait, de passer directement dans le canal et dans le fleuve. Um, Um, ça a pris, on a fait des mois et des mois avec des négociations des avec des ingénieurs, on a fait, afin de permettre, on a fait, de littéralement envoyer, on a fait l'eau de pluie directement dans le canal, mais pas directement, on a fait, mais indirectement dans le canal de la chaîne. Pour l'instant, ces quartiers restent coupés des rives de fleuves, tel un chaînon manquant sur l'accès public aux promenades des berges entre le quartier de la chaîne et le quartier de Vieux-Port. En dépit d'une longue et intime relation avec l'eau, les environnements urbains de Griffintown et de Pointe-Saint-Charles sont chauds et secs, recouverts de béton, d'asphalte et de gravier, déconnectés de fleuves et de canals, un dessert urbain entouré par l'eau. Le défi. Nous pensons souvent, nous pensons souvent l'eau comme un produit. Nous oublions que c'est un milieu vivant et que nous faisons partie de cet écosystème. Nous sommes faits à 70% d'eau et 45% des Québécois boivent l'eau de fleuve. Il n'y a pas de frontière entre l'écosystème de Saint-Laurent et notre organisme. Sans eau coule dans nos veines. Carol Mayrand de Fondation David Suzuki. La charrette 2011 sollicite votre créativité pour des propositions qui visent à établir une nouvelle relation entre l'eau et la vie en ville incitant à penser à des façons novatrices d'imaginer et de célébrer la présence d'eau dans l'environnement urbain et la vie quotidienne de Montréal. La charrette lance le défi aux participants de proposer des interventions architecturales, urbaines, paysagères et encore de l'ordre de l'installation publique 
qui nous amènerait à reconsidérer la présence d'eau dans la ville. En tant que responsabilité civique, exemple, on a fait deux projets, on a fait de Tianjin Wetland Park par Torrentscape Kong Jianyu, de infrastructure publique, Potsdamer Platz par, par Atelier Dry Saito, euh, réalisé à Berlin en collaboration avec Renzo Piano, ou encore comme œuvre d'art. Oh, excuse-moi. Ou oh, encore comme moyen de divertissement et œuvre d'art. Ou encore comme œuvre d'art et ce, à n'importe quelle échelle. Les soumissions seront évaluées sur la base de leur originalité et de leur créativité. Ça, c'est un projet, on a fait pour The Wondrous Water Square, on a fait un projet réalisé, à, à, mais en cours d'être réalisé pour un, un square public qui sert comme bassin de rétention en plein centre-ville de Rotterdam. Les soumissions seront évaluées sur la base de leur originalité et de leur créativité, en établissant la présence de l'eau comme un élément structurant de projet et en tant que partie intégrante de la vie en ville, en répondant aux préoccupations environnementales et écologiques, en particulier à la gare de l'eau, en montrant comment l'eau peut, géné peut générer les infrastructures civiques, un espace public ou un paysage urbain et en interprétant les besoins et les aspirations de la vie urbaine contemporaine, et finalement, en reflétant le contexte spécifique physique, culturel et environnemental de Griffintown et Point saint charles Merci. Par rapport à ces photos, j'ai lu un texte récemment de Jean Descari, où elle en parlait, on a fait des projets d'archipel, un peu un retour sur le projet archipel. Euh, puis elle a fait le commentaire, pas par rapport à cette image, mais quand même, on a fait un sur type d'image, on a fait un sur type d'aventure, on a fait de l'époque. Où elle en parle, on a fait que sa mère ne connaît pas même la définition de mot environnement. Ça n'existait même pas, en effet, dans son vocabulaire à un certain moment. Je pense qu'on a fait ces, ces, comment des choses ont changé. J'ai le plaisir euh, maintenant euh, d'accueillir euh, ce soir. Euh, deux architectes de Toronto, James Brown et Kim Story. Um, Brown and Story Architects est une pratique de l'architecture canadienne basée à Toronto, Ontario. Créé en 1981 par James Brown et Kim Story, le bureau est composé de designers professionnels multidisciplinaires, urbanistes, architectes, paysagistes, techniciens et experts en visualisation, spécialisant dans la conception et des recherches de l'espace public de l'urbanisme, des infrastructures, des paysages et de loisirs. Le travail des architectes Brown and Story a été reconnu et récompensé dans les concours locaux et internationaux, y compris le Toronto Historical Board pour le projet de démonstration de Garrison Creek, que j'espère devoir nous présenter ce soir encore, et le prix de design urbain de Toronto pour la rue College Street Master Plan. Par ailleurs, le projet Young Dun Dundas Square, le plus achalandé espace public à Toronto, a été récompensé des prix des revues Canadian Architect et Progressive Architecture. Leurs œuvres ont été publiées et présentées aux nombreux lieux au Canada et à l'international, y compris à New York, à Milan, à la Biennale de Venise, à l'Université de Toronto, au Congrès de l'UIA, à Barcelone et à Fuori Uso à Pescara. Ils ont participé au concours international Lower Dawn Lands de Toronto Waterfront avec Stoss Landscape Urbanism et Zass Architects en 2007. Et ils ont complété tout récemment, au mois de juillet, le projet de revitalisation de Kingston Park, un parc multi-usage régional de 7 hectares situé à Chatham, Ontario. J'espère qu'ils vont nous parler ce soir de leur œuvre en architecture et en design urbain dans l'eau joue un rôle structurant. Bienvenue. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, James and I are very happy to be here. James is relaxing in front of me here while I'm doing all the talking. So I hope you will uh, confront him with many questions afterwards. Uh, um, it was very interesting for us to be invited uh, back to the CCA to speak about our work. I think the last time we spoke here was about Garrison Creek and it was uh, many years ago. Um, 
And the slide that is up on the, on the screen is actually a slide of a model that we made talking about uh, buried city, flooded cities um, that went to the Venice Biennale with the, with, you know, with the uh, sponsorship of the CAA, CAA, CCA, sorry, and uh, the wonderful hospitality of uh, Phyllis Lambert. So it's, it's really a thrill for us to be back. It's, uh, it's also interesting for us to uh, sort of revisit Garrison Creek. And uh, Garrison Creek is work that we actually uh, instituted about 20 years ago because we were working on an open space uh, typological classification for the city of Toronto. And we were categorizing different kinds of open spaces, linear parks, uh, squares, uh, large neighborhood parks. And uh, we were trying to find networks in the city uh, of Toronto where these things are happening. And the course of, the, of Garrison Creek, which is really a, a buried ravine system uh, in the west end of the city uh, that no one has seen or heard of in, you know, in 100 years, it was actually a, an interesting story about the history of Toronto. But, um, but for us, uh, we, spent 20, well, we spent about 10 years of sort of constant research. And, and it's interesting to revisit, as I say, because uh, looking back at it, it seems to have sort of uh, funded our research and our projects in, you know, in, in an academic way or in a design research way for the, for the next uh, decade following that. And so what I'd like to do is uh, really uh, introduce, uh, many people now haven't, haven't seen the Garrison Creek Ravine project uh, in many years. Uh, and so I would like to be able to review that with you uh, tonight and talk about it in terms of the things that we've been able to pull from that as a method into other projects. And then we'll, we'll do a brief survey of some of the other projects that have come out of that. Um, and uh, for, f I, I wanted to uh, underline the fact that uh, for us, uh, the Garrison Creek Ravine has been sort of uh, very interesting for us because of the methods we've pulled out of it. But also, uh, it's also been a disappointment ultimately for us because of the, of the research that was done. It, it seemed to be adopted as a sort of a, a nostalgic exercise. And uh, recently, um, a book was published in, in uh, Toronto by the University of Toronto Press that talked about um, that talked about water in Toronto and water systems in Toronto. And so they asked us to write a text about Garrison Creek. And I just wanted to start this with a, a quick paragraph, which, um, the, and the name of our title was Buried Alive, Garrison Creek is a Rediscovered Extended Waterfront. And uh, the, uh, the paragraph I wanted to read is, uh, the best way to describe the research into water in Toronto is with one word, dry. After the stories and the old quaint pictures have been collected and the maps have been traced, Complacency settles in, usually followed by commemorative signage and bronze letters that stand in for what's not there. These efforts are comfortable, safe, and quantifiable. And after a brief flurry of discovery walks, I just lost my place, and newspaper articles, we're able to safely bury the creek away in the bottom drawer with the other civic nostalgia. After a reasonable amount of time, the material is rediscovered and the same cycle is repeated. I hope it's not like that. Now we've, we've, uh, I think it's becoming a little bit more interesting for people again. There's a new generation of uh, public space enthusiasts in uh, Toronto who are becoming more and more interested in this again. So, um, and our, our point of departure is, is that uh, river, the, the Garrison Creek system is, is something that is more than a tiny creek meandering through the city, but it was a landform. And it points to the disjuncture between cities and their natural geographies, their watersheds, uh, the lack of proper mapping of cities, and uh, the loss of a cultural infrastructure in the city that has caused a rift that uh, perhaps by readdressing water infrastructure in cities can be, uh, can be reborn. Um, this is one of those quaint pictures, <laughs> which I have a number of in here. But uh, the, Garrison, the history of the Garrison Creek is that it was, uh, it was a, really a founding landform of the city of Toronto, the early city of York, town of York, um, as, as the western edge of the city. And as, a, as the original creek, it was called Garrison because Fort York was founded at its, the mouth of the Garrison, Lake Ontario. And um, 
it was nav it was navigable for about five or six uh, kilometers by canoe uh, originally, and then, but it, because uh, of its sort of popularity as a site for early industry, became polluted and uh, became like an open sewer, and then was uh, buried in the 18 between the 1850s and the 1880s while the ravine still persisted until the ravine was more or less covered up by bits and pieces over the years. This is a picture of the construction of the garrison, uh, of the garrison sewer. This is a, and, and this is a picture again of really uh, what was important to understand was that the, the, the creek, which was, would have meandered through here, this is shortly after the burial of the creek. We really do, don't, in fact, have a picture of water in Garrison Creek. But um, the actual ravine itself was up to uh, you know, 90, 90 meters wide and could be as much as 20 meters deep. So it was a significant landform that traveled through the city uh, that was eventually, you can see its sort of evolution in the city through, um, uh, through schoolyards, uh, bits of parks, curves and streets, things like that. And uh, you start as a starting point, here's, you know, a big chunk of Toronto, our Toronto Islands, uh, and Ontario Place. Garrison Creek actually starts at, at here. This is the uh, this is uh, Fort York at this point, and the Garrison Creek actually follows this zone. So you can see, if you're looking for it in the map, it would be very difficult to find. But that is actually the trace of Garrison Creek. It branches here, it goes up there, it goes up there. Um, so that was a sort of our starting point when we started to look at this. But it's interesting when you look at it as an aerial photograph. There's the waterfront down there, the dome. But you can see you can see sort of a track of that going down through the city, which is not as easily to to see in mapping. And one of the first things we started looking at, which was has been very important for us, is is the idea of mapping to understand uh, adjacencies, things that are the, the maps that were available then were were basically mute. They weren't telling you about dynamic systems under the surface. So that was really an important starting point for us. This is an early map, uh, the Philpott's map. I think it's about 1792. You can see the founding. This is the original 10 blocks of Toronto. This is the, the Don River going through here. This is the Tattle Creek, which formed really the eastern edge of, of the town of York. And here's Garrison coming up through the wilderness with the, the Garrison at that point. So this was really right at the edge of the city. You can see over time, we're starting to build some piers. Uh, this is the Don River. Tattle is already quickly becoming uh, extinct. It's, it's already, you can only see that bit of it now. It basically goes through here. But Tattle Creek, or uh, sorry, Garrison Creek is still, is still very much in evidence going through here. This is about our Bloor Street there, if you know Toronto. Yeah, and I also, I also must apologize, some of these are blurry slides. Um, these were all kind of done before the age of, of proper equipment. We were cutting and pasting and things like that, so I apologize for some of these being blurry. Uh, I really wish we'd had a computer then. But anyways, this is, a, a, again, a later map. You can see, again, it's, uh, you can see the city's building up. We're losing more and more creeks. This is a bit of the uh, Tattle Creek going through there, but you can still see the start of, of uh, Garrison Creek there and, and, the, and, uh, and, the, and the Garrison. Now, when you type, but the, that was sort of the, hyster the hysterical, the historical uh, mapping of Garrison Creek, and what you could learn from that, and there's lots of those maps, and we trace them all very carefully to be accurate, to accurately locate where the creek went under the existing city grid. But the other point was really to start looking at it as a geographical landform. This is, there's that, that little square with, we determined was our study area for Garrison Creek. Uh, this is the, the Oak Ridge's moraine, so it's, it's really a much larger system. This is sort of Toronto, that area of downtown Toronto that we're looking at was about there. So what we're looking at is a whole system of creeks and rivers that are like a fingers in a plane that kind of go down a, this plane into Lake Ontario. So the idea is to start looking at that part of Toronto as a geographical landform. So you see that little rectangle is actually our study area of uh, Garrison Creek again. There's the creek. There's, uh, this is the uh, Algonquin shoreline, the Davenport Ridge in Toronto, which is actually a, a, an original shoreline of a glacial lake many, many thousands of years ago. So basically, from that 
uh, part of the creek, or sorry, of, of the Davenport Ridge, you have all of these kind of creeks going through the city of Toronto. Again, uh, looking at, uh, then looking at it as a series of contours. Again, we're still trying to, you know, find this is here's Garrison Creek coming up the side, and there's the Don, but to really start thinking about how the city has its ridge and then starts moving slowly down the ridge. So basically what we have is a whole series of waterfront, storm, storm water, watersheds, all moving slowly down into the lake. Again, uh, this, is a, this is showing the original line of the waterfront along here, and then uh, where we are now with our waterfront, our harbor front area here. And again, all of those creeks that are in, in the city of Toronto sort of natural watersheds that we have. Looking at the whole metropolitan area again, we started mapping areas where the ravines and public spaces were coming down to the city. This was actually a project we were looking at 401 and uh, 401 and Young Street. But uh, really you could see that all of these, all of the public spaces of the city were really kind of being formed by natural ravine systems and that was our public space system. We didn't really have a very well planned out city necessarily. So this is again that same map, but uh, spray painted with car paint at those days, uh, really shows that all of our open spaces really are linked quite carefully to ravines. Again, you can just barely see the trace of the Garrison Ravine uh, as, a, as a buried landform. So going back again to that, that rectangle, we started looking at it, uh, started doing a series of analytical mappings of that where this is the original waterfront. This is the sort of the, the fill. Uh, this is where the island airport is. Um, this is where that Davenport Ridge is. So this is showing the outline, not of the creek, but of the ravine itself going through the city. Then we took, and then we decided we were looking at that square within that point. So this is Bloor Street, Queen Street, sorry, Queen Street, Spadina, and Dufferin. Um, Looking at that, as you can see, you know, where that's going through, you can start tracking where the schoolyards and the parks are and uh, where streets are curving, uh, you know, major parks, Trinity Bellwoods Park, which, is, was, which was a big uh, study area for us in the project. That's a big slide. Um, that, uh, that's Queen, I'm sorry, that's Queen down there. That's that same block. So we started just doing a whole series of explorations of that. So here's just the outline of the, of the Garrison Ravine. The creek is sort of meandering through that. And then when you overlay that, that's the original condition. Now when you come, I'm sorry, this is, again, this is a product of time, but uh, this is, again, the system, uh, infamous system of, of uh, Toronto of the park lot, so that when uh, England was attracting uh, the land, the gentry and soldiers who were over in Canada to settle, they would give them these large lots called park lots which are about, I believe, about 300 feet wide and about probably about three kilometers long. And uh, basically, this is how they overlaid that system, uh, a very sympathetic system over the, the Garrison Creek ravine. But what's interesting is when you see the, the, the melange of uh, streets that happened, that is the same area of those, how, how those park lots have evolved over time so that the creek has had its sort of the ravine has had its sort of effect. So you can see where streets bend. This is Little Italy. This is really the hottest spot on College Street, and we think it's really because of the creek. This is a curving street. All of these things are following the course of the ravine up through you know, large parks, schoolyards over here. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a fascinating sort of detective act to find out how all of those things occurred over time. Then uh, again, looking, and then what's interesting is when you started looking at where institutions were sited the, within, this, these are the things that have been built within the, the, uh, the original shape of the ravine. These are the original park lots that have been scribed on top of that. You can see where buildings uh, have been, uh, we found that a lot of the, well, the original villas that were sited, each one of these park lots had a villa on it. Um, and they all faced the lake, of course, but they also turned to face into the ravine, so they were slightly skewed. So when you saw them on the site plans, you realized that uh, the ravine was sort of the second, second order of siting of these villas. And then when you saw certain church buildings that have seemed to be buried in the landscape, then you see that they're actually on the banks of what was once a ravine. Our house is sort of here. 
So we're really just trying to create waterfront property for our house. <laughs> this is another uh, sort of pointillistic kind of uh, idea that this was looking at the depressions within that space. So this is, these are the open spaces that chart the, the ravine. And then these are sort of the low points that occur in all of those point, in all of those areas. Sorry, and then this is looking at adjacencies where there are, are where again, where these kind of low, low points are, but where all these kind of points of connection happen in between those things. This is also kind of charting the sort of the elevation of those things as they kind of dip up and down on their way back down to uh, the lake. Now, this is, uh, this is actually on the banks of the Don, and I please pardon the blurriness of the image, but the idea behind this image was that Again, how, they, how the original uh, surveyors laid out a city on top of this natural landscape that we had, it was basically ignored. And the idea was trying to get to a sort of, I think, a Victorian ideal of taming the landscape so that you had basically a nice even topography. You can see here they're trying to cut down a hill and they're going to fill a, a gully with that land. And that was sort of a, a common way of settling the wilderness in North American cities, so that where you, you once had a, a, a beautiful ravine landscape, it's been sort of uh, you know, filled up. This is a former brickwork site that is now, uh, and, and then was filled with garbage, and then has become a pretty kind of uh, nondescript space in the city. But, uh, and that's basically sort of remnants of the ravine that you find through there. Uh, this is uh, Christy Pitts at Bloor. Uh, this is from the about 1910s. And, uh, and they, but you know, the idea about the, the ravine was that it also spawned a whole culture of economy, a culture of, uh, of institutions being sited along its edge. So this was a, 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 gravel, a gravel pit. Several of them were located around, a, along the banks of uh, the creek. So those became really important parts in the world, in the, uh, uh, in, in the landscape of Toronto. You had greenhouses located on them. You had amphitheaters located on them. Uh, all kinds of kind of important things that were sort of, uh, you know, that were sort of the heart of the west end of the city. This is uh, Christie Pitts again, so that's where that, that pit was. Again, it's, it's you know, the, there seems to be a pattern of, of freezing these landscapes with either tennis courts or large ball diamonds. So as the ravines, uh, the ravine landform was being eroded slowly over time, you found, uh, we found in this, uh, actually this is a bird's eye view of Toronto, and this is on the cover of William Dendy's book, Lost Toronto. But um, you see the garrison is really kind of moves up here, up through here. And when and you start counting, it's hard to tell with this blurry print again, but there's actually, at this point, you could see that the ravine and the creek were coexistent with the city. So as a co-evolving system, there was a certain astasis that had been, had been achieved. Uh, and what happened, uh, as you can see, all of these bridges that allowed the city to coexist, to sort of simultaneous space with, with the ravine. And I think in this, in this uh, uh, you know, drawing alone, you can identify 13 different bridges. And so we sort of talked about, started talking about how the landscape in the city coexisted as a co-evolving system, so that when there is a, an effect of a landscape, the natural landscape, there is a accompanying effect to the grid of the city and, and vice versa. So in these steps, you see the original landscape of the ravine. Here's the, the creek and there's the ravine, which uh, then the first settlement, you'll have the villas, which are kind of, uh, uh, you know, turned towards into the ravine. And you have a certain kind of, and you see also the lines of the park lots being devised through the section. And then you started having kind of uh, bridges. This would be like a, an earlier trestle bridge. You have some settlement happening. Then the, tr the, the trestle bridge becomes more of a concrete bridge. You have here, you have the, the ravine, the, sorry, the creek has been buried, so now we have a sewer happening here. We have more, we have more settlement. And then we get to the point where we are about right now where the bridges have been buried. They're actual bridges that are physically buried. Uh, the ravine has been eliminated and you have, the city has sort of tipped the balance. So we've lost that watershed quality. We've lost the ravine landform. At this point, you know, as a possible future, then maybe there's a way of reinstating 
uh, the ravine as a, as a connected system of, of parks through the city. And that was our first point of departure. How could we bring back, not as a st nostalgic exercise, but something as a linked network that would link the west parts of the city back to the waterfront. This is a shot of the Harvard Street Bridge um, in a sort of degraded form, but this was you know, part of the ravine traveling through here and traveling through here. And, uh, and this really, and this is actually not a, a small bridge. This is about 30 feet high, you know, that opening, and, uh, and, about, and about 25 feet wide. So it was a major connection in between parks and parks, which allowed all these things to coexist. Now what you have now, that's that same bridge there. So that is basically just sort of filled up and mounted up towards it. And there's several examples of that through the city. Uh, we used to have community. We had a group. There was a community group of about 400 people that were very kind of the, that were following all these things, and we kept ending every meeting, urging people to get shovels so we could just dig it out. But it hasn't happened yet. And that's from the street side. So you see, you know, the, the city has sort of swallowed these spaces, and they really, you know, they, and they become pieces. It becomes it's easier to lose these spaces when they become disconnected. When you work towards the uh, further south from that, that to the Trinity Bellwoods area, uh, there was actually very, this is a, a wooden bridge that was at Dundas and uh, Shaw and Crawford where you have the first generation of a bridge, a wooden bridge that comes across here, travels through here, travels through there, and travels through there. So it's an amazing structure that allowed that ravine to travel through it. You can just see, you know, um, we have some settlement just starting. Uh, and then as this, as this ravine keeps going on, you see the, the, there is the, the villa that is facing into the ravine and still facing the lake. We have the uh, founding of Bishop, Bishop Strawn College, uh, which re later became Trinity College at the University of Toronto, uh, siding itself on the banks of this ravine. You have a landscape in that ravine at that point, which was this sort of verdant uh, uh, landscape, it was actually part of a route of migratory birds that still follow this track of this ravine. But that kind of thing, which is degraded into this kind of uh, incredibly bland, uh, what we now call the peanut, uh, as the space. Where people, some people on one tour thought that this was space had been made by someone dropping a bomb by accident during the Second World War. And, so you have a, a loss of memory of what these spaces were. This is a, a very, um, a, even a, a more recent shot of that. So where you have basically this landscape that could be rich and could be, uh, become more than it is. So you had a system here where this, this is the face of Trinity College facing Queen Street as its formal face, but as it faces into the ravine, it becomes far more kind of interesting and uh, you have the chapel coming out. This building is, is, uh, is gone now. So. Uh, and then further on St. Hilda's Walk, you have this beautiful sort of grass amphitheater. Here they are performing uh, Aristophanes the Frog. And, uh, so this, and, and you can still see traces of this amphitheater in the landscape, but it is, it is kind of gone. This is sort of where we are today. The black part is what's not there, basically, but it's underneath the ground. This is the, and this is sort of what the, the sort of the peanut shape is now. This is sort of the dotted outline of, of what was Trinity College, and, uh, and that is where the villa uh, originally stood. So we, start, we did a whole, you know, very long series of how this kind of evolved over time. This is a picture of the earlier trestle bridge that went across the, the ravine, and which was uh, replaced by a concrete bridge, um, concrete arched bridge. This is a very interesting shot, because you see things in transition. You see these beautiful, very, uh, beautiful kind of, uh, not villas, but stately homes kind of locating along the edge of the ravine. You see, uh, you know, the bridge still kind of reinstating that connection so that you can move through the ravine. You see the, you know, this traveling through. It's sort of a simultaneous state. Uh, that is that bridge, uh, which is, again, one that is completely buried now. It's amazing to think, but you can see, you can actually see uh, when you're there uh, and these, that railing actually persisted until the 1960s. But this was buried. This was buried while they were building the Blue River Danforth subway. Uh, so they, knew, they were looking for cheap places to throw their fill. So these pieces of ravines, because they weren't connected anymore, uh, they, were, they were easier to, uh, to lose. And again, we have that uh, fabulous landscape down at the base of it. So one of the things that we were working on uh, was the idea of, because Trinity Bellwoods Park was a very large park, um, 
this really Dundas to Queen down here, we thought, what, hap what would happen if we actually did try to reinstate a system, not the, not the ravine itself, not the creek itself, but a series of ponds that would travel through there, uh, uncovering the bridge, creating the ravine that would move all the way through this part of the, of the park and uh, really creating a, a, a depth of a landscape that would recall that while really forming a, a whole new kind of way of addressing the park, its flatness and, and creating a whole zone, more area in fact when you think you're coming down, scooping down than if you're going straight across. Uh, an ancillary project in this zone was kind of proposed here where you would have uh, a, a basically a, a pond that would clean the water from the neighborhoods coming into it and having a sort of a, a, an ambulatory going around, uh, around the pond, uh, locating, you know, uh, connecting to the original, one of the original university buildings that's here. So this is sort of an alternative piece when we knew that they weren't going to build all of that for us. But the idea was really just trying to bring water back into the system and using the water uh, as a way of, uh, as, as a way of, of as an in, in an infrastructural sense, because there was a point where a light bulb went off, said no one's going to give money to fix a park. So if we could kind of connect this into an, to an infrastructural system, you start thinking of water as a means of cleaning the storm water. I, I don't speak French, but I, I believe that Mark was giving a very good explanation about combined sewer overflows, so I'm not going to go through all that again. But I think... Uh, that what, what happens is you can create a system that's treating water, that's reusing it, recycling it from the storm water itself and not, the, uh, not the, the, the sanitary sewers. You have an opportunity to create new landscapes in the city that create, bring a new heart back in. Because our point of con uh, departure here is that when you take that landscape away, you lost, you lost the institutions, you lost the landscape, you lost the habitat, you lost the, uh, an economy. Uh, so that these things are more than just a nostalgic kind of, wouldn't it be nice to have some water in the park? It really kind of, it starts making a system of making a living. So that, that's one of uh, the models, again, that we, that we built for the, the Venice Biennale. I think it's in a cupboard at City Hall right now. I don't know where it is now. Um, this is another uh, part of that park idea in Trinity Bell. Sorry, I've done it again. Um, in Trinity Ballads Park where we reinstated uh, St. Hilda's Walk. This is one of the buildings. This is like that plan turned the other way, but, but reinstating the original amphitheater, creating uh, or recreating uh, the walk that went, that started from Queen Street, came through here, bordered the, uh, and bordered the, uh, the ravine itself. And uh, part of that, this is probably one of the few things that actually was built that, uh, this, this kind of modest walkway, but I was talking about a braided, a braided network of paths where you, we created a zone for the existing trees and new trees to be planted, a, uh, an asphalt pad here bordered by a concrete sidewalk and a 400 millimeter wide curb here, that allowed, and, and then a limestone fine path here that allowed people to use uh, the St. Hilda's Walk in many different ways, so you could bicycle, you could uh, walk with your kids, you could uh, jog here. So the idea was that you created a broader way of, of moving through the park. Um, now, one of the things about this, this is an interesting slide because it shows, at the same time as the plan that, that talks about we're going to bury all the creeks and we're going to make sewers out of them, at the same time they still show the creeks. So it was an invaluable resource for us to be able to track, to, to um, re, you know, to show in the existing, you know, in, in the existing city, then where the original creeks were, um, even though that was a point for its departure, at least then there was an understanding that there was a natural landform underneath the city. This was the, the plan that uh, the engineers in the city of Toronto were proposing uh, for what was called the Western Beaches Storage Tunnel. Uh, again, similar to I think what Mark was describing as an interceptor, uh, because of the combined sewer overflows coming down through the city. Uh, and spilling into the lake, they proposed having a great big uh, tunnel that was going to cost what they called $3,000 million, and, uh, and which would catch those combined sewer overflows and ship them to the east end of the city to be treated. Now, our, um, and you can see what they're really thinking about the city is, is basically a big parking lot. Um, and so, 
we, uh, naively probably, but uh, James and I fashioned a, a very fast drawing in a couple of hours one afternoon where we showed the outline of the ravine. We showed the parks that were in the ravine or connected to it. And we said what you could do is kind of connect those, uh, the, the sand, the, I'm sorry, the stormwater flows into these parks. You could treat the water, you could hold it there so it wouldn't be moving through the system so quickly as a storm system, when, when you had a storm. So the volume would be held and it would, be, it would slow it down so you wouldn't have to build this $3,000 million tunnel at the base. And you could use all that money you would save to improve all these parks. So it was sort of a mercenary kind of uh, maybe sneaky way on our part, trying to find a way of improving a park system in the city. Um, and so uh, this is an early, another earlier map. You can see how that's going through the whole kind of outline of the cities. We went into that scale of plan again, where we started looking at uh, the Waterfront Regeneration Trust, I believe now, gave us a small amount of money to do this study just so we'd shut up and go away, I think. But anyways, we, but it gave us a, a really important opportunity to take that map that showed the original sort of landscape and the, and the shorelines and start doing some really serious kind of mapping of it. So in this case, we, we really, because uh, the point of view of the engineers, because we took that drawing to the engineers, about 20 engineers in pinstripe suits, the city of Toronto, and, and they looked at us like we were insane. And, uh, but, we just, and, and, but we still had a group of about 300 people still kind of fighting for that. And it was really the beginning of, of uh, looking at non-structural stormwater management, which we called rainwater in, in, in ponds. And uh, so first of all, they said, well, you don't have enough open space for all that water you'll be collecting. And we said, well, actually, we have 135 hectares of just straight parkland we have about 250 hectares of schoolyards, and we had another 200 hectares of kind of open commercial lots or parking lots or things like that. So we had actually 620 hectares that you could use to make a system, which was sort of news to them. So we started really looking at this quite carefully, uh, mapping stormwater lines, where they would come in, how they, would, how they kind of, uh, coincided with where the, our ravine was, because it's a natural watershed, so you, know, you should be using that. Again, these are looking at sort of the hot spots going through there, the parks, the schoolyards, how they create special zones. So we created, you know, where we decided to look at the Bickford area at Bloor Street and uh, Trinity Bellwood here. And then uh, looking in this case, really showing kind of branches of a system that would, again, that was like the, the you know, the, the blue and yellow drawing kind of made into a more serious kind of uh, way of looking at all these actual storm lines and how they could actually be brought into systems of ponds that could then work through a whole system of watersheds. Accompanying that was this one, which showed all the main streets going through on the east-west parallel. And at this point, there was talking about uh, intensifying main streets, like building, you have all that infrastructure, you should be building more densely on College Street, Dundas, Queen Street. And our point was that if you have all of that going through this watershed, we should be talking about intensifying our public spaces as well to go with that. Um, this was the Bickford plan where we started going into actual kind of project uh, possibilities. This is like the existing condition with the ravine kind of shown as a sort of a hurricane underneath the surface and uh, talking about systems of uh, ponds that would start you know, collecting it at this point, move underneath Bloor Street to systems of ponds, a long pond, small wetland in the schoolyard. Um, the, the teacher said we couldn't do that because the kids would like it too much and they would get dirty, so we couldn't do that. Uh, and this is sort of, again, sort of the diagrammatics of, of that system, how you could actually make that work. This is, again, a large, large park area, as large as Trinity Bellwoods Park, but in, cut into small pieces because of, you know, filling in, this is the Harvard Street Bridge, this is Bloor Street, where all those things have been filled in over time. And then at, uh, as, a, as the sort of the, the last sort of gas, we actually did a, 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 an engineering study with a large engineering firm and determined that if you used cisterns, if you used uh, downspout disconnections, if you allowed for percolation, if you did all these things with ponds, in a certain test area within the Garrison Creek system, we could take 45% of the water out of the underground pipe system 
and, uh, and disperse it sort of naturally through the landscape. Again, and that was a study that looked at sizes of lots, what was the dispersal of water that you could, uh, you could, uh, you could assume that you could percolate into the ground at different sizes of lots. And so it was, it was a fairly extensive study. But, um, but it's, it's sort of, again, what we have now is really uh, bronze letters in the sidewalk, uh, fish in the sidewalk, things like that, that said this is where Garrison Creek was. So, and, and so, although that's a kind of a large disappointment, um, it's also the actual kind of methods that we gain from that have been really critical to our office. Um, where we have systems, sorry, like the Eglinton system, Eglinton Crosstown, where we did mapping for, for uh, the TTC, looking at all the places where that underground light rail transit would be crossing ravines and how those kind of worked with land uses, main street types, uh, so that, you know, this is a blow up of that. So these things became really kind of critical issues to kind of identify where spot where, where stops went, uh, where you could make connections into the city. I mean, the point being, uh, any fluid system, uh, whether it's a, a, a creek, whether it's a ravine, whether it's a, um, sorry, whether it's a TTC line or public transit line, should bring more improvements with it. Um, this is, this is a, uh, a competition we did um, together with Curry Levitt Fong in uh, Copenhagen called Nordhaven where we started looking at new types of building types, how you build new things into, into the, the landscape using water as a positive connection, looking at systems of, of creating kind of special zones in there. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time so I have to go very quickly now but uh, where you have the landscape coming into that, creating kind of different new building types that worked with that. Um, even uh, with our Downsview project that we did in 2000, talking about the Oak Savanna as being that kind of fluid system within a very large site that would connect back into the, uh, into the surrounding landscapes. So, so you see this plan, you have a, a kind of a stream, as it were, of uh, oaks that actually start creating kind of a secondary linear park system, creating that zone that, that opened up the park to the city. Again, at the larger scale, you can see that working in with, here's the, there's Garrison Creek, there's the islands. Just thinking about that as a, a major, another major infrastru natural infrastructural uh, piece. Uh, in Dundas Square, looking at a smaller scale, um, where we looked at actually Dundas Square, one of the things for that competition um, before we started building it was that we realized there was a tributary of Tattle Creek there. And one of the stories about Garrison Creek was that during Hurricane Hazel in 1954, uh, where everything was flooding, actually all of the manhole covers on the Garrison Creek popped off and there were geysers coming up out of the ground because of the pressure buildup. And so um, we used that as a theme to actually have uh, geysers coming up in the park so that here in the larger kind of, you have this, again, the shift. This is actually part of the, where the branch of the tattle came. But you have a point where a park where you have, you can have 30,000 people at an opening or you have a kind of a, a spot where the water is just coming through and it can just turn off. So basically it turns off for major events and, it, and it's on the rest of the time. So this is really kind of a, 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 our small expression in a smaller project about the water systems in the city there and uh, you know it really becomes that kind of high point that they, you know they take the pictures of the newspapers and that's the testing point. We actually and, and the person that designed this with us well uh, Dan User actually has just finished opening the uh, water system at uh, the World Trade Center so he's, he did a fabulous job on this project. Um, again Dundas Square and then as a uh, kind of as a system though as a point along a larger system the connection to the subway and to the path system, all these things are really critical for this public space to be connected uh, to the city around it in terms of, uh, in terms of systems. Uh, again, uh, a small a project that we're actually building new silos um, on the shipping channel in Toronto so that we're actually building, like actually creating industrial areas that work with the water and try to create kind of reflections and and green walls edging onto the water. Uh, this is the Don River competition that we did with Stoss, uh, Landscape Urbanism, and ZAS. Uh, looking at actually a, a system of 
of the dawn coming down into the lake, but actually as an estuary. This was about naturalizing a, uh, the mouth of the dawn, which was a very straight uh, canal that had been canaled basically from there into the water, but actually to make that into a natural system that when it flooded, these would become islands, and when it wasn't flooded, this became part of the parkland of the project. And then really working uh, with the mapping strategies, again, developing new types of buildings and, and road types and open space types that would work with a, a, a new way of building in the city. This is looking at all kinds of sort of bridge typologies that would actually make that, again, that simultaneous space that we are looking for. And then this is like a series of studies looking at like a, a typical slip of space of building in that zone that would kind of create new housing types going through there. These are some of the views of that. Um, and uh, I wanted to really sort of complete, uh, complete this with a quick view of our West Toronto Rail Path, which was opened about a year ago. As another, there's no water there, but it's actually another system of a linear system of a, a system that exists in the city that in the past has served as a, a former railway line that has cut off, when it came through the city, cut off uh, a lot of the neighborhoods and streets covered uh, uh, with industrial lands and then some neighborhoods around it. The city got a hold of one of those train lines and put a, a multi-trail on it. So. As we were working on that, we thought, okay, this isn't just a bike expressway, this is a linear park which can serve to connect. This is part of a larger system, again, that moves through the city. This is the railway lines here, and this is the, the pathway, so that within that nine and 10 meters, we had an ability to be able to create a linear park that would connect back into the neighborhoods uh, while creating a zone for the bikes, but also sort of, you know, if you've ever worked with cycling experts, if you try to get a meander in a bike path, you really have to fight hard for that. Um, working with community groups, we made great big long drawings of this thing. That's our hallway at our uh, outside of our office space. Looking at this in detail, really taking this stuff seriously in a fine-grained way to uh, find those ways to create you know, those zones where this could connect green spaces, where you can create little off areas, where you can create drainage areas. This is all naturally drained, of course. Uh, new and so that you know if you live here you could go on a park that does that or you can do on a park ride that does that just creating that kind of flexibility and choice this is the one of the beginning points of it uh, that's looking down from a pedestrian bridge at one of the juncture points to the city this is uh, one of the entrances uh, it crosses the railway line so that you have a rail we, where we have a bridge this is where we have access points going into it. We've got Cortan Steel, which would just accept graffiti, except the first time someone graffitied it, the Parks Department came and painted it brown. Um, it's one of the things we have to live with. But anyways, and this is sort of one of those uh, railway bridges that we, that we reconfigured. And then uh, bollards that are made out of Cortan Steel, again, they were folded into uh, shapes that kind of prevent cars from getting onto the space. And you know that's another part of it there, but it's really kind of just finding those systems that you can work through the city. And and for us, uh, working with the Garrison Creek was one of those things that allowed us kind of see the potentials of lose, using these linear networks and infrastructures that can start reconnecting the city, creating new edges around it, economic development, new built forms, and finding new ways of, of re reclaiming industrial areas of the city, whether it's a ravine, a creek water, a fountain, or a bike trail. I think that's my last slide. Yes. Thank you. Je pense qu'on va passer, um, mais premièrement, est-ce qu'il y avait des questions pour uh, notre invité? Vous allez avoir deux temps, on a fait à la fin de soirée aussi, on a fait à poser des questions, et en prenant un verre, on a fait aussi, vous pouvez poser uh, des questions si c'est utile. Merci beaucoup, on a fait Kim, c'est uh, vraiment fascinant, on a fait, c'est bien de revoir, on a fait tous ces dessins aussi encore une fois. Thank you very much, it was really wonderful. Um, Nous avons un deuxième invité ce soir, uh, Leah Margulis, uh, qui est venue aussi de Toronto. 
pour, pour ce soir, pour la présentation. Léa um, Margulis est professeur et professeur adjointe en architecture de paysage à John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design of the University of Toronto. Elle détient une maîtrise en architecture de paysage uh, de la Harvard Graduate School of Design et un baccalauréat en beaux-arts en design uh, industriel de Rhode Island School of Design. La recherche de Leah Margulis se concentre sur le transfert des connaissances multimatériaux performantes et de technologies entre des disciplines. Et elle, elle cherche à comprendre et à articuler la pertinence de paysages émergents performatifs comme infrastructure urbaine. Plus particulièrement, sa recherche récente est axée principalement sur l'eau et l'infrastructure des eaux usées dans les climats arides. Enquêter sur, le, enquêter sur la pointe de rencontre entre le naturel et de fabriquer l'artificiel, comme invention écologique et technologique, le tout dans des contextes uniques sociopolitiques. Elle est co-auteur de l'ouvrage « Living Systems, Innovative Materials and Technologies for Landscape Architecture », pour lequel elle a reçu une subvention de la Fondation Graham. Elle va certainement nous parler de ses recherches sur les techni technologies matérielles contemporaines en paysage, particulièrement par rapport à l'eau. Léa, merci. Thank you, Mark, uh, and thank you, Emily. Um, for inviting me and for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've been asked to discuss uh, the book uh, Living Systems and the research that I've been doing um, around the idea of um, technology uh, and performance in, uh, in landscape architecture. Um, the book, sort of the background to this is that um, uh, while I was in my studies Uh, which was not too long ago, in fact, it was in the early to mid-2000s, uh, uh, there was a, a kind of emergent discussion about the idea of landscapes as, uh, as performative uh, ecological systems within the city, something that, um, that uh, Kim had just recently, or just talked about, but something that was sort of a, a kind of a, maybe a reintroduction or, or re Uh, uh, re retelling a story, a narrative in, uh, in landscape architecture, which looked at, at this idea that uh, many of the landscapes that we're uh, dealing with today are toxic grounds, many of the landscapes that we're dealing with are uh, degraded sites, um, there are flooding issues, there are um, issues of, of a variety of different water management. And so the kind of the, 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 the aspect about uh, taxonomy uh, of how we actually discuss landscapes, how we actually um, refer to landscapes, is maybe an interesting kind of point of departure to think about what we're actually after. And so I started thinking about the kind of the categorization that we typically um, use in terms of landscapes. Um, we look at parks, we look at, at, at waterfront, Waterfront, waterfront parks, we look at playgrounds, we look at the kind of spatial and programmatic categorization of landscapes. Um, and I was asked myself the question of whether we can categorize materials according to their performance. What do landscapes do? Can we build landscapes that retain water, landscapes that clean toxic waste, uh, landscape that metabolize um, biological activity? and so on and so forth. So the book essentially looks at the kind of a language, a language that is about operations, a language that's about um, kind of a, a, a looking at how you could also um, uh, navigate the territorial scale with the site scale and the detail scale, something that Kim has shown us a number of uh, very in incredible examples. Um, so, um, The, the book is sort of predicated on, on two ideas. One is that landscapes are dynamic and interdependent, uh, that hydrology, as in water flow, uh, river basins, watersheds, 
is inseparable from topography and geology and the capacity for water to infiltrate the ground, uh, recharge aquifers and so on. That water is inseparable from biological life, including vegetation and soil, the health of the soil, the health of, of vegetation and the, the interdependence between vegetation communities and water and soil all have to do with whether you can maintain erosion or, or soil stability. So those are inseparable and cannot really be uh, uh, divided from one another or looked at separately. Water is, is part of a larger ecological system. And that water is also cyclical, changing and at times unpredictable uh, climate patterns, which ranges from drought uh, to flood, from humidity to snow. And we need to really address water in all of its phases, all of its volumes, all of its capacities and, um, and forms. Living Systems also addresses the systematic management of uh, water and sanitation, uh, which includes the supply of drinking water, its collection, quality monitoring and delivery, as well as the collection, treatment and release of stormwater runoff and sewage. And in that respect, opens up the question about our conception of, uh, of, of water and the value that we give to water and the monuments that we uh, build to harness water. The positioning of technology and design can at once transform water from sacred to profane, from a natural phenomena to an economic commodity. And, and that to me is a really important aspect of understanding how we th really define technology, how we p position design, what is the ideological premise from which technology is actually uh, pursued. So we saw a number of, of uh, examples in Toronto, and this is another one that, that I recently looked at, uh, which is a ubiquitous uh, condition in most North American cities. Uh, and this is exemplified in, in, um, in an area that's uh, part of the Don River uh, watershed, uh, which is the Leaside uh, Business Park. Um, it's uh, located uh, uh, right at the precipice of the, the Don River, which runs uh, right here, and is about 50% uh, impervious. And this ma mapping essentially shows every single catch basin, every single drain hole and pipe that drains rainwater or surface water from the ground and then outfalls directly into um, the Don River uh, watershed. And this is basically diagramming the kind of cyclical um, or seasonal aspect of volume and frequency, meaning that water is not always the same. You don't have the same quantities of water at all times. You have to essentially think of accommodating uh, the quantities in the flows, and how do you then build uh, landscapes that accommodate that kind of dynamics? How do you build for drought, and at the same time, how do you build for an inundation of water? So this, uh, at, a, at a heavy storm, essentially uh, calculates to about 150,000 cubic meters of water flowing directly into um, into the Don River. And you can see here the kind of uh, relationship to topography and, um, and the sub-water basins or sub-watersheds of water collection within one specific site. And the question is really how can we get off the grid and introduce a series of, um, of strategies that can um, maintain essentially um, water on site and uh, treat it during uh, the, those peak volumes. Um, you, we might have, or Mark has discussed this idea of a combined uh, sewer flow and this idea that uh, our infrastructure really is at uh, uh, full capacity um, and as we uh, increase our urban surfaces or impervious surfaces, the more water inundation you have um, within, um, within the system, um, actually um, uh, creating floods, uh, pollution, uh, and so on. So the important factors uh, in this monthly flow are all the snow melts, the chloride from, uh, from salts, and so on, and, and uh, navigating around these issues um, is, is one of the things that, that we've been looking at in, in um, 
our uh, studios. Um, so one of the kind of the concepts that that, uh, that uh, should be perhaps taken from this is the, this idea that, that the prevalent approach to urban water management has typically been, been to get uh, water off the site as quickly as possible. And that is the, the kind of the take home message from the engineering systems that have pretty much uh, uh, um, been um, um, the primacy or the primary uh, approach to water management in, in cities. Um, However, the, the, the kind of the increase of urbanization and loss of pervious and vegetated surfaces, urban runoff is reaching uh, the maximum care capacity of urban infrastructure system, and consequently the approach to get water off the site uh, is quickly changing. In, in Toronto, uh, recently, uh, all new construction sites must accommodate, for instance, for 100% uh, stormwater retention capacity, for a 24-hour period, and the idea is to relieve the peak volume uh, and inundation and release uh, release it slowly. Uh, th this example shows the kind of uh, effects of urbanization in the background. This is uh, in D in Denver, outside of Denver, uh, quick uh, kind of urbanization and, and increase of impervious surfaces has uh, degraded uh, much of the waterways. Uh, um, uh, also increased uh, land cultivation, deforested many of the lands, and, and, and the overall result is this kind of eroded uh, landscape. Um, you would have essentially runoff coming from, um, from these urban areas, eroding soil um, with their increased volume and, um, and velocity. Uh, this is a project by uh, Bill Wenk, um, for Shop Creek, and the idea is essentially to then take uh, the the um, uh, take the flow and try to attenuate its volume by introducing what the, what is called a drop structures. And the drop structure is essentially a series of these uh, uh, centrifugal for, um, uh, topographies where water is actually draining into it, circulates upon itself, and then loses its velocity and leaves out and does that in a kind of chain, such that, that these are structures that essentially are a mix of soil and cement. They are um, structured as such that you could see the kind of um, stepping uh, in section. And in plan, you can see how the, the water essentially goes in, moves around itself, and then leaves in a slower speed. Uh, another project that Mark already showed, uh, which is uh, something that, that Portland, the city of Portland, has taken on, this idea of the 100% stormwater retention on site, such that the entire street is um, built out of a, uh, a series of these rain gardens. Uh, these are cement uh, tubs, if you will, that uh, uh, receive their runoff water from the road directly into them. They, they also double up as planters, and they're a redundant system in a sense that once, that once a planter fills up, it goes into the other, and so on and so forth. And the idea is to essentially maintain all of that water on the street, that nothing actually, zero, zero water leaves the site. Um, and one of the things that I started looking at is this idea of evaluating these, uh, these designs in a sense that, for instance, when you have this kind of a concrete planter, a tree would then be limited in terms of its growth and its root system. And so how can we think about actually a continuous uh, strip of, um, of soil and water retention as a, as a kind of a next iteration of this design? Uh, that would be the, sort of the, the critique about this, this project. Uh, another project that uh, Mark showed was the, the Potsdamer Platz in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, by Dreisaitl, and the idea here is that you have 13 buildings around the square uh, which collect their uh, run rainwater uh, in cisterns and then release it into this, um, this uh, a f sand filter uh, biotope. Um, it's uh, s essentially lined with a uh, polymer membrane and then um, and then filled with a, a sand filter to then clean the water before releasing it 
to the um, water system, um, the regional water system. Uh, another example is by Landworks uh, Studio, and this is looking at the employment of, uh, of, of uh, a cut and fill strategy. And the cut and fill strategy is basically uh, taking uh, the existing soil on site, um, creating these berms to allow this kind of retention, and, and then um, the kind of vegetation that you get growing um, in, in the valleys is different than the vegetation that you get growing um, on the peaks as this is fully inundated uh, with water on a frequent basis and this is not um, ir irrigated and not inundated with water. So the kind of gradient of ecology uh, is a potential in terms of thinking about topography, vegetation, and water retention. Uh, all this water then, you could see it in plan here, and this is uh, a section that essentially would be cut right here. Um, looking at actually using the clay soils underground um, as the kind of membrane layer, as the, the layer that, that would not allow for the water to infiltrate into the ground, just keeping it there with a sand or, or kind of aggregate layer uh, on, on the top, and then, and then funneling all of that water to a centralized rain garden um, on, on this side of the site. Another uh, strategy for water management uh, is looking at the, the integration of green roofs. And this is a project by Vogt uh, Landscape Architects, um, uh, together with uh, Herzog and Demeron for the uh, Allianz Arena. Uh, this is essentially what you're looking at. The profile here is the, uh, the roof of a garage. Underneath are two-story parking garage. So this is at grade. And this essentially rises and becomes the green roof. Um, this is also the pathway and the circulation to get into the Allianz Arena. So the combination here is essentially um, uh, manifested through uh, porous asphalt and uh, impervious, uh, non-porous asphalt as the combination. Uh, from the porous asphalt, that becomes the, retain, the, re the retention layer um, also, the vegetated layer, all of that water then goes underneath the drainage uh, layer to a centralized rain garden uh, on the side of the garage. Um, so uh, I wanted to also talk about this idea that uh, not all water uh, is created equal and that water is really a relative term which requires a sort of expanded lexicon to address its contextual climate, the regional infrastructure and management regimes of a particular area, its quality, its quantity, its cycles, its physical states, its sources, its end use and associated energy. And, um, and this was a part of a, of a larger uh, project that I've been working on um, titled Out of Water, which is looking at this idea of, uh, or looking at water um, in arid climates and rather the, the, the idea of water scarcity. And interestingly enough, the, the problems uh, of, of, uh, of arid climates and the problem of aridity uh, can be shared uh, with uh, areas of, of inundation, of plentitude of, of water and, 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 uh, and flooding. Um, and so the, the kind of the, uh, I guess the take home message is perhaps just the, the, the kind of uh, idea of, an, of a, a much broader lexicon uh, of water that we need to think about and then also analyze um, the projects accordingly in terms of um, its, its, its context, uh, what the project does in terms of the water, uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, collecting, converting, uh, distributing. Um, and more importantly, uh, to, to really transform uh, the value of water uh, from waste to resource, which has kind of been the, 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 the primary aspect of, of water scarcity in arid climates and, and the, uh, the uh, expanded lexicon of water in arid climates has been to look at, for instance, sewage water treatment, 
uh, for irrigation and recycling, which uh, several countries have uh, taken on as um, as a, a, a now as a, as a practice, uh, as well as desalination. So that that's kind of the broader spectrum of of areas that we don't have to deal with uh, in these climates, but. Um, um, but are basically are are similar in terms of um, um, the kind of the the, the expanded uh, notion of what water is and how it relates to the way we manage it in the city. Uh, this brings up another question about the definitions and and perception of efficiency, um, which in many cases is narrowly defined by a single discipline, a profession, or an authority or ministry. Uh, and in parallel, the notion of resilience, uh, flexibility, or, uh, and multifunctionality, or integrated design thinking. Uh, so in, in that regard, in, in the realm of thinking about whether you have too much water or whether you have too little water, uh, I have found that, that the kind of aspects about water management always boil down uh, to, to uh, the question of integrated uh, design. Um, in this case, uh, we looked at the uh, Haiti and, uh, and the fact that while, uh, excuse me, while Haiti uh, suffers from uh, immense flooding uh, and hurricanes and uh, um, uh, as well as uh, deforestation, erosion, and so on, uh, they also experience, uh, they're, they're one of the top 10 uh, countries in terms of, of having no access to potable water. So how do you actually reconcile this idea that in a place where you might have so much water, you actually have no water? Uh, and the question really it becomes with the kind of, of uh, perhaps the, the aspects that we might take for granted in terms of, of the infrastructure of water and sanitation that we have in our cities, um, that we're trying to uh, break away from and trying to introduce these kind of um, media mediated landscapes, these kind of retention landscapes in between. But the question is, uh, you know, what what are we? Uh, how do we evaluate the kind of technological premise um, and take the place uh, in a, in a place where uh, no government exists or or uh, uh, let's say a, a lack of of uh, management in the in the government. Uh, subject to uh, I increasing floods um, and and so on. Um, so we looked at this idea of how uh, we can actually integrate um, integrate water capture as part of the retrofit condition um, for for a Haiti community that has been um, uh, destructed under um, under the the recent uh, earthquake. And what we propose is essentially is, is taking some of the areas that have been demolished and turning them into a kind of um, uh, integrated water capture management uh, slash uh, erosion control slash cultivated uh, crop cultivation with vetiver crops which are, are grown in, uh, in Haiti and can actually produce uh, an economy, a local economy there. So uh, this was looking at, at these kind of gabion structures that could be integrated into the slopes as both erosion uh, management uh, as well as the structure of the um, houses themselves. Uh, another example of this kind of extreme idea between drought and flood, this is the case of, of uh, uh, Rio Besos in, in Spain. Um, and this is essentially a, a river that uh, is uh, typically Mediterranean um, and is primarily dry throughout the entire year, then experiencing this deluge of water, an absolute inundation. And for many years, that floodplain has basically been uh, devoid in, of any human uh, activity. And um, uh, the idea was that it's, it's strictly an infrastructural space um, due to safety. 
And the idea here was how do you how do you actually coexist with these extreme conditions? How do you inhabit a landscape that is um, that its dynamism is so extreme and absolutely detrimental? Um, the park here integrates uh, a couple of technologies. One is an inflatable dam technology, such that in, in during the year when there is no water, all the water is actually retained uh, in these basins, uh, allowing for you could see this kind of aquatic ecology to to uh, um, to emerge. Uh, obviously, a park system that can now be accessible, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and during a flood, this entire park is connected to a sensor system with a base in its uh, weather station in, in uh, Barcelona, which... ...mais je pense qu'il n'y en a pas d'impression à faire. Alors c'est prévu pour minuit dimanche soir pour l'envoi en effet des fichiers. Just to repeat it in English, um, the su submission of projects now, the deadline has been moved slightly till midnight on Sunday night, because this year one of the changes that we've made is that there's no panels actually that have to be submitted, um, and in order to give you a bit more time to work on it, you can just hit the send button before midnight um, on Sunday night to uh, submit the projects. Um, deuxième point, c'est les uh, dates limites des, uh, excuse-moi, Um, à partir, on espère, si tout va bien, en effet, que le, uh, les projets vont être mis en ligne à partir, en effet, tous les, les projets soumis vont être mis en ligne à partir de lundi, on espère pour midi lundi. As of noon on Monday, we'll try to put all the projects online. Um, that's important for two reasons, to make it uh, accessible uh, to the jury, pour que tous les membres du jury en pour, pourront, en effet, pendant la semaine prochaine, en effet, voir tous les projets qui vont être soumis. Um, avant que se rend compte uh, à la jury, uh, mais aussi parce que on va uh, cette année, on a fait, on a décidé aussi de um, de organiser un vote de public. Um, C'est un peu uh, American Idol um, de, um, de uh, la charrette où on vous encourage, on a fait chacun, on a fait c'est que de prendre le temps, on a fait pendant la semaine uh, avant le choix, avant que les choix soient annoncés, à vous donner l'opportunité, on a fait c'est à, à revoir, on a fait tous les projets, à uh, regarder ce que vos amis, collègues et d'autres ont fait en ligne et vous pouvez prendre tout le temps nécessaire um, et voter aussi pour votre projet uh, préféré. À la remise des prix. La remise des prix va avoir lieu uh, vendredi prochain um, um, à l'UQAM, pas à l'école de design. Je sais bien que je devrais mettre un, un enseigne dans la porte de l'école de design parce que tout le monde va se présenter là. C'est pas à l'école de design, c'est à l'ancienne école de design, uh, qui est l'ancienne école de technologie supérieure. C'est l'Agora Hydro-Québec, en effet, qui est l'ancienne chaufferie, en effet, qui se trouve, uh, ou l'ancien atelier de l'école de design qui se trouve en plein milieu de l'île où on a fait de, euh, des sciences, on a fait de l'UQAM. Alors, très proche à, à Métro Place des Arts, on peut le voir. Alors, Agora Hydro-Québec, 18h, vendredi prochain, pour la remise des prix. Uh, so, the uh, awarding of prizes will take place next Friday at UQAM, but not at the École de Design. Instead, it will be taking place, uh, actually, at the Agora Hydro-Québec. Um, in the science campus uh, of UCAM, situated accessible directly from Avenue President Kennedy or Place des Arts Metro um, uh, directly, but it's on the interior of the lot, so take some time to uh, find your way there. A beautiful room, um, but we'll hold it. In. Um, cette année, uh, au niveau des uh, modalités uh, de participation et surtout de soumission, on a fait quelques changements. C'est-à-dire que euh, habituellement, en fait, euh, euh, tous ceux qui voulaient soumettre des projets devaient euh, le faire, enfin, l'année dernière en tout cas, euh, faire sous forme de poster euh, numérique, sous forme de euh, PDF, qu'on devait recevoir, plus l'imprimer. Cette année, on n'aurait pas l'imprimé. Par contre, on a rajouté d'autres petites choses qui sont... Qui nous permettrons aussi pour nous de mieux comprendre le projet. Donc, toujours ce euh, poster... Euh, en format numérique A1 horizontal que vous allez nous faire parvenir plus une image clé du, euh, du projet et enfin une vidéo la vidéo ça serait entre 30 et 60 secondes ça peut être très simple vous la prenez avec votre appareil photo votre téléphone ça peut être vous en train de parler ça peut être ce que vous voulez essayer de, de la faire assez simple et en même temps de parler du projet et ce sont ces Trois choses là que nous vous demandons en fait pour, euh, pour chaque projet. 
Uh, just to repeat in English, um, the, so the submissions this year, once again, as I pointed out, they, we're not asking for any panels to be submitted. We're asking you to submit at uh, Sunday night uh, at midnight a uh, PDF in a uh, A1 horizontal format with the proposal maximum 10 megs that will be su uh, sent to the FTP site at CCA. Um, in addition, we're asking for one uh, key image of the project that would be associated with each one of the projects, um, also a maximum of three megs in JPEG format. And thirdly, we're asking for a very short 30 to 60 second video, um, giving you the opportunity to talk about your project. It can be a talking head that it's you yourself filmed uh, talking or your team talking about the, the project or presenting a model of the project or whatever you decide to do, but to give an opportunity to explain the concept of the project. Take some of the pressure off of also having to put a lot of text onto the panels to explain the project. Um, that gives you the opportunity to present it in the form of a very brief uh, video, uh, 30 to 60 seconds. Je pense qu'on a à peu près fait le, fait le, fait le tour. Euh, Peut-être une dernière chose, vous pouvez aller voir qui sont les membres euh, du jury euh, sur la. Oui, voilà. Vous avez donc euh, les membres du, euh, du jury qui sont, euh, qui sont présentés ici. Donc on a Jacques Rousseau qui sera le président du, euh, du jury, donc architecte à Plania, Montréal. Ensuite, on aura le plaisir de retrouver James Brown, qui sera aussi un membre euh, du jury. Julien De Smet, qui est euh, un architecte qui travaille entre euh, la Belgique et le Danemark, en fait. Et euh, Juliette Patterson, qui est vraiment architecte paysagiste euh, à Catalyse Urbaine à Montréal. Donc, on aura le plaisir de les accueillir. Ils verront tous vos projets aussi. Et la remise des prix aura donc lieu le vendredi, vendredi la semaine prochaine. Je pense, que que... Je pense que c'est oui, oui. Alors, nous avons terminé. Je vais inviter Mme Lambert, si vous voulez dire euh, un mot, avant qu'on aille tous boire un verre, un verre de vin dans la maison chez les s'il vous plaît. Alors, formidable. Je trouve que c'est un projet tout à fait euh, poétique, au fond. Euh, mais la poésie qui implique évidemment une science euh, bien évolue. Euh, je veux remercier euh, tout le monde pour leur présentation. Je veux surtout remer euh, remercier euh, Marc Podubiak pour l'élégance euh, de son texte et de ses images. C'était formidable. Et... Euh, J'ai fait des notes pendant que euh, ça, ça se déroulait. Euh, oui, il y, y a certaines choses auxquelles je pensais pendant que euh, sans présentation, c'était euh, que euh, l'utilisation de, de, de... C'était étonnant, en 1975, on a fait le canal à la Chine. Et j'étais membre de Heritage Canada à cette époque-là. Et euh, il y avait quelqu'un de Parks Canada, et il disait, personne n'utilisait le canal les premières années. Il a dit, oh, on a fait une grande er erreur de faire ça. <rire> euh, C'est curieux, l'évolution, je veux dire par ça, l'évolution des, des habitudes, n'est-ce pas? Euh, alors, évidemment, il y a beaucoup de niveaux sur lesquels vous pourriez travailler dans ce concours et euh, on sera absolument fasciné de voir, et vous aussi je suis, euh, euh, les solutions qui vont venir. Euh, euh, to, euh, Kim Tor, euh, Story a parlé de dynamisme euh, de, de l'eau et de, de projet et euh, je pense aux premières images que Marc à montrer et je trouvais ce dynamisme de la terre qui, qui s'est euh, défait complètement et on, on voyait comment c'était une, une grande unité à l'époque là. Je trouve ça absolument euh, fascinant au point de vue de comment on peut penser euh, à cette chose. Euh, et puis, euh, vous n'avez pas beaucoup parlé de floodplain parce que je crois qu'il y a ce problème et ce danger euh, quand on discute 
ceci, ceci, vous avez montré évidemment les, les, les grandes euh, inondations d'eau au 19e siècle. Je me demande pourquoi c'était fascinant d'avoir deux personnes euh, qui présentaient, deux artistes scientifiques de Toronto, mais euh, je suis étonnée, est-ce que nous sommes tellement en arrière à Montréal qu'il n'y avait pas personne à présenter Ce n'est pas, pas Montréal, et, 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 mais, mais est-ce que c'est ça Qu'il n'y a, a pas des gens qui travaillent sur ce niveau ici Pardon Ok, c'est juste une question, ça m'a frappé. Et... Euh, En tous les cas, c'est euh, aussi une autre chose sur les charrettes. C'est une des premières charrettes qu'on a eues il y a des très longtemps. Elle était sur l'échangeur le, le Park Pain. Et euh, cette, euh, ce, 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 cette charrette a changé les choses. Parce que, est-ce que vous voyez le, cet échangeur Park Pain maintenant Non c'était démoli finalement. Alors je trouve que ce, ce, les charrettes, euh, euh, quand même, c'est la façon de, par, de penser euh, à la ville. Et les étudiants ont beaucoup à, à donner à ces, ces, ces pensées. Euh, alors euh, on, on, on touche un site qui est très, comme vous le savez tous, je crois, un site qui est très euh, neuralgique parce que c'est un site qui, euh, euh, où on, on prend, il y a, Marc a démontré l'état de pro, projet, et il y avait une grande fuss, about, of course, about, well, about everything, about the, the whole roadway that's being done now, whatever it's called, a, a Turcotte, l'échangeur Turcotte, it's just somewhere around there. And there's also the problem of um, Griffintown, and the lack of any kind of coherence about that. And I guess the last thing I would like to say is both speakers raised this elegantly. What is the use of water in the city? It seems to me that, that is a huge issue that you must face because, sure, it's very pretty to have little ponds and things like that. I, I lived in California for a while uh, where I was a de developer and uh, architect and developer, and um, you know, people used to make these dreadful little settlements with a, with a pond or, uh, around them. There was one image that somebody showed, and I thought, uh, <laughs> my, my head sort of went like that. So there the are many issues, and surtout, il n'y a rien de plus excitant de devoir prendre un projet comme ça en main et de le mener à bien. Alors je vous souhaite tous un très bon euh, un très bon très c'est féminin masculin le la charrette de, de, une très bonne charrette ok <rires> je, je crois qu'il y a des, euh, un vin qui est servi non oui, exactement. dans dans le maison jaune aussi il y a des expositions à voir aussi alors à vendredi prochain <rires>